big mecha battles. BMB, baby. Friendship ended with Dork Souls. Armored Core is my new best friend. FromSoft took a pile driver and knocked this modern take on the formula out of orbit. Mission structure falls into two primary categories, completing objectives such as data collection, solid snaking your way through areas with the subtlety of an active fire alarm tossed like a frisbee, or sabotaging vital corporation operations. Many of these conclude with the second main feature, dogfights against the game's plentiful bosses. Featuring a staggering roster of 50 unique encounters I battled across three playthroughs into New Game Plus Plus, the game progresses brilliantly in this span more closely to Nier Automata's alphabetical storytelling rather than the standard replay with your OP tools. Of course, you do get access to those, and they are the biggest determinant of your success. While dexterity, mobility, clever positioning, reaction speed, and strategy are all important, difficulty is largely shaped during AC assembly. Willingness to experiment with various parts to counter enemy advantages is the key to excelling in combat. We are a Swiss Army Blade against the Half Hundred Horde. My fellow pilots, prepare to sortie into this two-part marathon ranking of the Armored Core 6 boss difficulty. Number 50, Mad Stomp, Invincible Rummy. It's the soldier of Godric in a mech with baseless bravado. Mad Stomp sounds like the juvenile war cry of Mecha Billy Madison after he reamed eight-year-olds with dodgeballs, channeling his inner Michael Jordan. We're here to shatter Invincible Rummy's flimsy head cannon by firing up our base cannon. There's no mechanical analysis to be had. Only a highlight reel of kills so fast he can't even finish his hollow trash talk. A welcome palate cleanser after Chapter 1's ruthless finale, defenseless Rumbo gets trampled into this colossal catalog's basement. Number 49, Baron Flower, V3 O'Keefe. If you interpret Flower as life, you may as well call O'Keefe's call to action devoid of life. That's how this battle feels. An empty shell of the many AC battles to come. It's particularly awkward as a New Game Plus Plus exclusive, his combat offering consisted more of passively gluing himself to the barrel of my shotguns than mustering any reasonable offense. I genuinely thought his AI was broken, though he died too fast to confirm whether it was a momentary brain fart or a lackadaisical forfeit. Either way, based on that effort, O'Keefe is lucky it's enough to outshine the brittle bonehead at the bottom. Number 48, Tester AC, Defang Student Pilot. A name with expanded meaning throughout your playthroughs, initially your first taste of AC combat, this student quickly becomes a cash cow to speed farm for credits. To his credit, he actually puts up a commendable fight when your pilot skills are equally rudimentary. When you cash in your winnings from a dozen victories for the big guns, his paltry efforts are lost in a sea of artillery, blasting his dreams to explosive ash. By the time you revisit him with dozens of AC clashes under your belt in New Game Plus, this speed bump hardly registers on the Richter scale of difficulty. Number 47, Burn Pickaxe, Index Dunham. My first encounter with Index was a swing and a miss. This Joker ambushes you in a 1v3 against you and two Red Gun allies. He's rather slow about it, considering in my first playthrough his presence went completely unnoticed by me, opting to quickly complete the objective and forego the fight. I realized his existence in New Game Plus, a moment that was as brief as my original objective speedrun. I wasn't even using a build I intended for AC combat and still wiped the floor with him in mere seconds. I give him meager credit on the premise he's theoretically more challenging than the tester AC in an initial playthrough, if you don't sweep him under the rug. Number 46, Zhu Yu, Little Zhu Yi. Another early ambush, miniature zucchini comes in guns blazing during a data collection mission with what amounts to nerf guns mounted on a chihuahua. The only credit I can give is to this shifty bugger's speed, preventing my own weak arsenal from claiming victory before time ran out, not that I was ever in danger. In New Game Plus, with Foresight, I was able to intercept the surprise attack with the ferocity of a high-powered fly swat. This gnat at least gets credit for escaping our initial encounter, as cupcake tier as it may have been. Number 45, Deep Down, G2 Nile. In an alternate timeline where you help out our previous entry and their RLF allies survive the wreckage we were scoping out, you come toe-to-toe -to -toe with this red gun and his band of MTs, who went out in a blaze of misery in seconds. I'm guessing his paper bag HP accommodates facing a boss with enemy assistance in an escort mission, evidenced by his lack of repair kits, but I didn't expect him to fall over that easily. At least he landed a few hits, which is more than we can say for the previous pushovers in New Game Plus. Number 44, A18 times 2 and 22, Light and Heavy Cavalry. This New Game Plus mission variation pits you against no-name cavalry units that are more akin to a collection of mini-bosses than the full-fledged deal. With a fully decked AC build, the two light units are obliterated before the thick lad can reach you, and even when he does, other than a few meaty sword strikes, he's tapping out in seconds. I give some credit here for these light and heavy units in other encounters where they put up a stronger fight, and I imagine without a full aggro damage-soaking approach, you might find yourself quickly getting outnumbered here. 
However, imaginary difficulty is just that, hypothetical fiction. Reality slaps this trio into the bottom tip. Number 43, Infection V6 Materlink and Li Long G3 Woohoo Ha. I should have called these the dessert duo for how sweet this ass kicking is. The remnants of the Vespers and Red Guns cleaning up these stragglers is child's play compared to what the mission's finale has in store. This appetizer is hardly worth their weight in AC parts, and though there are two, their lack of allegiance prevents them from ganging up on you. I honestly forgot they existed until I revisited them in New Game Plus, where the drubbing was even more brutal. Like the past few entries, I at least give credit for acquiring some strategy to preserve a damage-free victory. Number 42, Guidance V7 Swinburne. In the grand scheme of your AC battle catalog, Swinburne's appearance is rather early. He hardly puts up a stronger fight than the D-rank arena battles you unlock before him. The key difference is his access to repair kits, an element you'll continue to see in AC battles moving forward. The endurance element makes survival slightly trickier than the bosses thus far, but he gets knocked hard for allowing a close range stealth strike before the battle begins. In terms of strategy, in New Game Plus I noticed that when you took advantage of this ambush, he takes it really personally. Stop that! This has him throw caution to the wind against dual shotguns and go for shocking strikes with his electric whip, a foolhardy approach against my kit. He died so fast I didn't even get to see him beg for his life. I even tried to let him live in New Game Plus Plus so I could see if there's anything behind door number two, but I tabbed back into the game during the decision while ensuring it wouldn't alter my pursuit of the true ending, and oops. No matter how you approach, disrespecting Swinburne is as effortless as claiming victory against him. Number 41, Shinobi Rokumonsen. If you do accept Swinburne's plea, after an awkwardly long intermission, an angry RLFAC bum rushes you to reward your coat turn. Yes, zooming full throttle in a straight line into shotguns and laser cannons. Real smart. Even if his approach lacks nuance, he does get the benefit of a stronger endurance encounter. You're forced to meter your aggression against Swinburne beforehand so he doesn't crumble ahead of his plea. Rokumon Sen also can't be stealth blasted upon entry, though his haphazard bum rush may as well count as one with how exposed it leaves it. Though it's a minor bump over the fight that precedes him, Shinobi isn't quite the ninja he implies. Number 40, AA-18A, Light Cavalry HM, V3 Pater. With All Mine taking control of the scattered forces with no corporate leadership to guide them as the true ending draws to a close, a battle against Pater in a generic yet speedy unit is all that stands in your way. He spends more time dodging than attacking. If he had mustered quick hits between his adept evasion, this could have been a challenge. Instead, his zigzag technique is all bark, no bite, quickly leading him to defeat at the hands of a triple playthrough battle-hardened player. Number 39, Steel Haze V4 Rusty. So, buddy. <sighs> When Rusty says buddy, the happy neurons in my brain fire like a haze of glory. My favorite of FromSoft's tragic friend tropes, his dialogue into battle gives me chills. The game is all about finding what and who you fight for. Rusty's assertion that he still needed to fight for the planet is as earnest as his accusation against you. He asks, who needs you as much as he states it? If you don't have a purpose, step aside so he can fulfill his. If you do, you'll need to prove your resolve is greater than his. This hype doesn't necessarily translate into commendable difficulty, but I love Rusty all the same. Very much mirroring the fast archetype I've alluded to as challenging to pin is his MO. He does start to pack a punch more so than his bottom dwelling peers, particularly with his melee combo, but he really suffers from his late placement in your playthrough. You've had ample opportunity to ascend the S ranks in the arena, which includes a simulation against the man himself. This experience under your belt allows you to dwarf any moderate difficulty he provides, even if I love every weathered scrap on this steely stud. Number 38, Steel Haze V4 Rusty Alternate. My New Game Plus rematch had an alternate rendition where the RLF's middle flatwell comes to Rusty's aid. He should have brought backup for this backup. This middling AC fell flat well before he could so much as finish his sentence. As the same exact battle with extra help, this is technically harder by the additive property, but the increase couldn't be more minuscule. Number 37, the Igdromoy Duo. My initial romp with these two was the tale of two halves. At first, I fought in the open and got rightly shredded for it. The lieutenant skewered me while the chief sergeant chipped away from a distance. Once the radio hinted to split them up, the intended strategy became clear. Using the arena as cover to divide and conquer was crucial. It's a classic FromSoft gank boss. Split them up and pick them off one at a time. They had a habit of not chasing me directly, instead vaulting over buildings for the high ground. 
This became predictable and let me pinpoint exact moments to quickly turn the tables while the other AC was diverted. Once it became clear that melee was the lieutenant's only viable form of attack, backpedaling and taking pot shots was child's play. As for the sergeant, lateral jukes from the lasers and returning fire when he was locked in place did wonders. I did go in for melee every now and again, which was risky with a high payoff. Overall, it's a matter of how simply you're able to separate them. If I were estimating difficulty solely on my first playthrough, this would be much higher on the list. In New Game Plus, I ditched melee and realized high impact weapons like shotguns brutalize speedy ACs. Using the same tactics, it became like shooting pilots in a barrel. Funneling them into my bursty offense did absolutely bonkers damage. It's an example of bringing the right tools for the job. Focusing on melee gambits to do meaningful offense isn't a good call in a 2v1 situation with high speed. But with akimbo boomsticks, this duo failed to reach their initial difficulty heights. Number 36, Reconfig, V5 Hawkins, and Dual Nature, V8 Pater. This was another moment of realization against fast ACs. For a long time in my first playthrough, I used dual plasma rifles and laser cannons. This focused my offense around linear burst shots with minimal tracking. Making the most of them requires stationary targets, at least for a moment, which is a poor match for high agility AC pilots that bolt circles around you. Choosing burst kinetic weapons to build more consistent stagger with respectable damage over time was a great compliment in between moments I waited for the perfect timing to blast with my laser cannons. This battle is much the same as the previous duo, yet lacking in cover to separate them. You're instead given an ally to provide distractions, making this effectively two back-to-back -back 1v1s. If you defeat one fast enough, you can flip the gank script on the remaining target, which is a nice reward for speed. Without cover, however, this is more challenging to do while avoiding meaningful damage, giving them the edge over the lopsided Ectromoys. Number 35, EB0309 Strider. Continuing the theme of difficulty in avoiding damage over truly threatening your defeat, the Strider is an early environmental boss that threatens more to ruin your S rank attempts than best you in combat. A stationary mining ship, it fires massive plasma rays from a distance, then volleys of lasers up close. The initial flight through the desert avoiding sniper shots is awkward to time. Shooting the leg afterward is rather simple, but the following section of flying long distances while managing energy to avoid laser fire is tricky, especially for the generator right in front of the main weapons. The final portion involves patience more than anything, which isn't my strong suit. If you take advantage of the varied elevation on the ship, you can avoid all damage and safely shoot during short downtime windows as the beams recharge. Of course, I can't help myself, and my greed got me disintegrated. It's a simple battle in theory with clearly defined stages. What makes it tricky is avoiding damage throughout each phase and putting together the perfect fight over a long encounter. Honestly, the realest challenge is the alternate mission in New Game Plus Plus that asks you to protect the mining ship on behalf of the RLF. Those speedy bots and buzzsaws surrounding and ganking you was one of the most difficult encounters in any of my three runs. As for the Strider itself, it pushes us further into easy but increasingly tricky to s rank territory. Number 34, AB08, Nepenthes. Another environmental hazard, this encounter asks you to traverse down a shaft with minimal cover while the boss fires beam barrages, charge shots, and missile volleys. ACs don't have amazing vertical speed or mobility, making the long descents between platforms feel like an eternity. The margins of error are much greater than the Strider, but in return the overall concept is more straightforward, and the actual battle is won the moment you reach the vulnerable spot. It gets a slight edge for its more challenging evasion, even if it is straightforward in theory. Number 33, AS07, Heavy Warship. Continuing our streak of less traditional battles, the Heavy Warship encounter is less boss and more wave of enemies. Stuck in a small arena, you're forced to fight MTs and higher end LCs with a quick pair on the ground while a third snipes you from above. Then a finale against the warship itself. Defeating the warship itself is as simple as assault bursting over to it and quickly blasting away the engine. These warships appear many times throughout the campaign, with their best appearance coming in an epic mission with infinite flight energy that has you competing with Cinder Carla to rack up a kill count in the double digits, which should indicate just how easy these are to kill. What makes this entry level introduction moderately challenging is less the warship itself and how hard fighting those LCs for the first time beforehand is. Even in later playthroughs, surviving all the waves while taking minimal damage is very tough due to limited space, cover, and the odds stacked against you. Even if it's not difficult to overcome come on the whole, the damage-free struggle is high enough to push it above its avant-garde peers. Number 32, EC-0804, Smart Cleaner. 
The Custodian of Chaos is another unique foe. The only combatant in the game that is almost entirely melee oriented, Smart Cleaner focuses on squaring up, getting in your face, and battering you with its fiery fists. The large model prevents you from overextending in close quarters, though it is possible to boost under the arms for certain attacks with adept timing. Mostly, it lunges towards you and punches. You respond by flying above, backpedaling, and resetting line of sight toward the weak point. While you can and should fire at the main body for moderate damage and maintaining stagger, critical hits require inserting your ballistics into its exhaust port. This builds up stun faster with higher damage to boot. What makes this challenging is anytime you reliably target it, you're in danger of being clobbered. While you can easily down cleaner with enough patience, flying around forever while taking little to no damage, killing it with the speed required for a high score means putting yourself at risk. I absolutely love this high octane proposition and found the size and style of offensive cleaner more intuitive to read than most bosses. It's a great design packed into an increasingly challenging package based on how hard you want to push its limits. Number 31, HAT 102 Juggernaut. A simple premise, the Juggernaut is from Sauce Mechanical Booty Smacking Simulator. Hacking heavy armor everywhere but its rear, this behemoth asks you to find a way to attack the ass for any meaningful damage. This is quite easy at the start, as Rusty does a great job of keeping its attention. After enough punishment though, Rusty takes a scripted exit, starting the real battle. It's a lot of missile fire and charges towards you. The mobility challenges to this point have been greater than an obvious dash forward, and even the mini-boss that gates you from reaching this point had heavier firepower. My biggest folly was still getting used to the controls and meleeing a lot of poor times, leaving myself exposed. More than anything, an inability to get behind in my first playthrough with my inexperienced piloting turned this into an endurance battle. I nearly ran out of ammo entirely, using my final few missile barrages for a photo finish. It was a memorable challenge that aged really poorly on return visits. More adept maneuvering on my end and greater firepower made it hilariously easy to devastate with Rusty's assistance. It died before he could even finish his sayonara speech. I give the juggernaut its due for posing a threat to the inexperienced, but he falls far far below what he aspired to initially based on how hard he falters with even a modicum of skill. Number 30, AAS-02, Cataphract. This oddly engineered tank is similar in style to the Juggernaut, mixed with the heavy artillery of the environmental foes. A lot of dashing towards you mixed with horizontal laser arrays, charged beams, missile barrages, all spaced out between consistent gunfire. Like the Juggernaut or Smart Cleaner, it has a specific weak spot to aim for in the center AC skeleton. Constant movement and drifting makes it a pain to hit consistently, though I didn't have much trouble evading most attacks and taking pot shots here and there. The difficulty comes in squaring up to hit the weak spot without taking substantial damage in the process. I tested things out such as jousting, which was a colossal failure, and I did not take that as a lesson and just tanked and spanked to win with melee. The speed intermix with the well-guarded weak spot and substantial artillery make this a solid leap into our biggest threat yet. Number 29, IA-02, Ice Worm. When it comes to stature, it does not get bigger than this gargantuan grub. For a battle with a simple premise, the layers of depth are staggering. Your goal is to use a specific laser cannon provided by corporations to break the worm's defenses. To do so, you need a direct hit to the face. As you can imagine, lining up a shot with a brief stationary charge against this massive mobile monster is easier said than done. If you miss, the only penalty is time lost, that is, if you aren't too close. Colliding with the worm is good for half your HP, and that's if it didn't fire off any coral bombs. Eventually though, you begin to recognize its attack power patterns and how to best position yourself for the perfect shot. Once you do, our best buddy charges his own ray, Evangelion style, siphoning a whole city's power into a single I won't miss. devastating blast. This gives me chills every time. What phenomenal sound design. As the impact of Rusty's badassery runs down your spine, it's time to close in for an offensive burst. This is a formality as any reasonable potency results in chunking the worm's HP by a third. It retreats and summons drones to harass you. While they're a minimal threat, they wreak havoc on auto-targeting. Your allies who've just been running around spouting commentary finally make themselves useful by helping cut their numbers, all the while the worm continues to terrorize the group. After your second hit, the worm gains more devastating offensive with huge point-blank AoEs, more coral bombs and lasers, on top of massive lunges at you. This combination of attacks does an incredible job of forcing you to evade at perfect moments to throw off your aim and timing. And now, you need to hit two shots to break the shield. 
This is where your HP starts melting with poor execution, something I can relate to. What I love is that the longer you fight, the more you recognize opportunities for attacks. In further playthroughs, I was able to identify small openings during the worm's scripted moments at the start of each phase. Right as the battle begins, if you zoom over to the left boundary, you can fly up to meet the worm's gaze and instantly blast it. As soon as you confirm the damage is locked into end phase one, assault bursting to the other end of the arena while it's locked in puts you in shooting distance of the worm right when it appears. As it summons its drones, you can beat the crowd and take advantage of the three scripted surfacings to knock it straight into phase three. And as the worm unleashes its coral power in a huge AoE blast looking skyward, you can soar up and blast it the moment its eye looks down before retreating. This is 100% consistent, relying solely on your ability to execute the strategy, timing, positioning, and aim required. These are incredible layers of skill expression, enhancing the value of difficulty over time, and while the worm may not pose the greatest threat in the game, its hits still pack quite a punch. It may be middle of the road in terms of challenge, but like Rusty summoning all the power the city can muster to go beyond 100% power, the boundless quality of this unique battle shows FromSoft's growth in creating extraordinary battles that don't fit the standard mold, and just how deep the skill ceiling in Armored Core can soar. We've got plenty of bosses left to fly through, but you'll need to join me next time for part two. Subscribe to the channel to stay tuned for that. Tell me what you thought of the Ice Worm and Company in the comments below, and leave a thumbs up if you want to support my own sortie against the algorithm. Thank you for watching today, and I'll see you soon in the second act.